Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Hey, listen, we want you to know, uh, before I dive into the message here, um, Carrie Pierce is not here today, obviously. Many of you know Carrie. He is our really interim worship leader now and doing such a great job. Uh, got word um, late in the week that uh, we knew his mom had been ill for some time. And uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, late afternoon, she passed away. And so Carrie has been with her. He was able to be, go and be with her and be there um, as he got word from, from his dad. And so I uh, have had an opportunity to pray and pray over him and pray with him. And I, I hope that you will do the same. So uh, we, we can do that. In fact, even as we close our time together, uh, we can pray for, for Carrie. Okay, pray for his family and for Kara. So we love them so much. But I want to say this. Um, Welcome to all of our guests. I know you, you already have been welcomed from here, and I hope from others who have greeted you as you've come. Uh, you're not alone. We have a lot of guests who are here today, and we're so glad that you're here. We are in the midst of now Easter series. It's Easter season, and you can see there it's, we're calling it Death to Life. Uh, the, the key question, I think, is something that happened 2,000 years ago, which is at the center of our faith. How does that impact my life today? This is the essence of the Christian life. And we're here to tell you it impacts our lives as believers in every way. Uh, from the core of who we are and everything that happens in our lives. And it's why Jesus said in John 5, verse 24, you can see it there, Truly, truly, I say to you, uh, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And Jesus is saying, now the gospel is more than just this, but he's saying, if you believe that I am the son of God, that I've come from God, and then of course he lived this perfect life, dies on a cross for us, and he's raised again. If you believe that, you, you, you receive this gift of grace, you don't, have, you don't face judgment, but instead you're passed from death to life. Friends, if you have received Christ, if you are born again, okay, and some of you think, well, born again, is that... That sounds like kind of a revivalist language. You know, that's Billy Graham language, isn't it? Uh, no, that would be Jesus language. Okay, um, he's, he's with Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born again to experience this new life. We're going to talk about that today. That leads us to this living hope. So as we walk through this month, I just want to kind of let you know, kind of give you a, a kind of a month horizon here uh, as we move forward. Today we're going to talk about despair to hope. Okay, we're going to talk about grief to joy next week. And then brokenness to healing on the 18th. Now, this is that day the pulpit swap, by the way. That's when Pastor Brian Carter is going to be here. I'm going to be at Concord Church. Uh, we're taking our choir and orchestra. We're taking a whole crew. They're coming here, and we're saying, just take over. And so that's going to be at 1045. Some of you will be on spring break. But if you're in town, okay, come. And it's all going to happen in the sanctuary at 1045. We're going to pack the house. I'm going to get there early. It's going to be lit. Okay, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> So I hope that you'll be there. Uh, it's going to be a great day. Hey, and listen, I'm telling you all this. Invite a friend to come. Invite a friend. Um, and, and then on the 25th, we're, we're talking about weakness to strength. That's Palm Sunday. There is, there's another, there's a choral um, orchestral kind of uh, presentation, sermon and worship and all the above on Palm Sunday uh, in the sanctuary. We'll have our services here as usual. Uh, and then we got Good Friday. That's East, you know, that's Holy Week. And then Easter is, is of course, April the 1st. Uh, I want to challenge you even now to invite friends to come. And I'm encouraging you to move from this time, 1045, okay, to 915. That would be your missional move to open up seats at 1045 in this room. We have, we have no connect groups yet except for our smaller kids. And um, so be thinking, be prayerful, be watchful about who you can invite to come. People that would normally come would come even as a cultural experience to come on a Sunday morning. So uh, you come and invite friends to come and meet you here or pick them up. And so we have services 915 and 1045 here in the Great Hall. Same in the sanctuary and then 1045 in the gym. All right. So let's uh, let's do this. Let's talk about uh, despair to hope. All right. 
Hey, Viktor Frankl was a, um, an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist. He survived the concentration camps during World War II. In fact, he survived Auschwitz. Uh, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, a fascinating book uh, that I have and have read and have looked at recently again. To, because here's what happened. Think about this. A neurologist, psychiatrist, he's a Jew, but he's thinking through the purpose of life. And what happens in a concentration camp, of course, is that everything that you might place your hope in is stripped away immediately. Think about it. Kind of a time lapse of sorts with what is the inevitability of all of life. Okay? So here's what Frankel, a, a, a doctor, a scientist, he's observing all of this, kind of a social scientist, and he's watching this in his own heart and life. And he says this, that, that what he observed in his friends, uh, you know, all of us, or his fellow inmates, all of us determine our worth or our hope is placed, you could say, in one of five things. And I think he, it's a comprehensive list. He says health, right? If your health starts to go south, do you have like, oh, I have no hope. Maybe even no reason to live. I'm dying, right? Health, family, professional achievement, fortune, and position in society. That's what he called it. That's a pretty comprehensive list. Minus one that we're going to talk about today. But all of us do this. We place our hope in these things. And, and, and so all that one might find their identity in or their hope in, in a concentration camp, of course, is stripped away immediately. So he's placed in this kind of case study terrifying case study where he's observing how do people live when all, can I say it this way, circumstantial hope is pulled away, taken away. Is there a reason to live? He determined that when, when, there is, when all these things are taken away, that there is no reason to live, that we must have a hope that goes beyond this life or your life has no purpose and no meaning, ultimately. The passage we're going to look at today is going to help us understand this. You've got a million questions in your mind, and as you think, maybe at this point, okay, so all of life is the inevitability. What is a concentration camp except all that we find our hope in is stripped away immediately at one time? Can I just say it? Ultimately, all of life is that. And this is the moment where I, I guess in the sermon you're going, I'm glad I came to hear this encouraging message. <laughs> Okay, we cannot move to hope until we understand what real despair is. And so I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 3 through 9. Now, this is a power-packed passage and uh, just a brief time to dive into it. So I'm praying that God will use this in your life. Now, here's your, here's your role. It's one thing for me to prepare and come and preachers to come and, and preach. Uh, your role now is to say, Spirit, speak to my heart. And I want to ask you a question that the Spirit would, would, would really enter into your heart. Think about this. What are you walking through now? What trials, suffering, circumstances are you going through now that are really causing you to question uh, your faith, that are really stripping away perhaps some hope that you have in your life? Uh, what is it that you're walking through? What trial or struggle are you facing these days? What sadness or grief are you experiencing? And, and, and think about it. Sadness and grief always has to do with loss. Something is being taken away. Or maybe it's anxiety that something is going to be take away, taken away. Maybe there's, maybe there's a general sense in your life these days that your circumstances are just wearing you down. And if we had time today, all of us could step up to the mic and share our own story. Right? And so as the Spirit speaks in your heart, the questions I'm going to ask is this. Is there a way to differentiate ourselves from our circumstances? Is there a way to, to remove ourselves? Are we simply the product of our circumstances? This is what Frankel wrestled with. Are, are, we simply, are we destined to a roller coaster life here in North Dallas based on our circumstances? And if that's the case, friends, and you know this, you're tracking with me because this is the way we live. On any given day, our circumstances change from hour to hour, and we live like this. Now, this is fun if you're at Six Flags, right? But in life, it'll make you sick, and it'll kill you, ultimately. Circumstantial hope leads to a crushing despair, and many of us live our lives that way. Many Christians have not 
figured out what we're going to talk about today. This message will change your life. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call gospel hope. First Peter chapter one, verse three. All right, look at this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's another way of uh, Peter saying, what a God we have. Exclamation point in the ESV. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Notice he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, we're into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, see, again, if you're following me, wait, wait that happened 2,000 years ago. What? Like now? This impacts my life now. Yes, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, what is this? This living hope, this, this imperishable, undefiled thing that's kept for us in heaven, this gospel, this hope we have, this new reality that we have, is kept for us. In this we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And the language there is such that he's saying, it because it's necessary. Why is it necessary? Look at verse 7. So that, oh, there's, a pur- there's a purpose in it. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that's some strange language there. We'll try to unpack a little bit because it's not what it first appears to be. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want to break this message down with just a few, real simple today, a few, few questions. What is it, this gospel hope? What is it? Where do we get it? Why do we need it? We've already hit on that a little bit. How can we live in it? Always the case. How do we apply it as we close this? So what is it? Well, notice it's a living hope. Now, most of us believe, and even a lot of Christians believe, that hope, biblical hope, is how Webster would define hope. Watch this. To want something to happen or to be true. Mm. To have an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation or positive outcome. I mean, a kind of wishful thinking. It says, with respect to events and circumstances. There's the word. In one's life or in the world at large. Hope, according to the world, according to Webster, is let's just really... Really hope deeply that circumstances are going to turn out all right. That is not biblical hope. And many of us live this way. Listen, circumstantial hope is not living hope. Okay? Any given day, again, your circumstances will change. You don't have to be, what, eight years old to know that if you are basing your life on circumstantial hope or positive circumstances, that is wishful thinking and crushing If we don't have a hope, this is what Frankel observed. If we don't have a hope that goes beyond that. Frankel observed this. He watched his fellow inmates that some would first turn brutal, like the guards. Even the kindest people, he said, would just turn angry and just live that way. Just like animals in response. He said some just gave up. And and they watched. He and his his inmates would watch certain ones. Uh Uh-oh, there he goes. They don't want to get up in the morning. Some of you have been there. Uh, they, they, don't want, they don't want to shower. They don't even get Ultimately, those, those would, they would die. He had one case. Um, this, this one guy was a, he was the, the senior block warden in, in his group, uh, an inmate. But he, um, he was a well-known uh, composer and librettist. And he believed, because of a dream he had, that he thought was a revelation, he believed it was a revelation. He thought the war was going to end on March the 30th. As the date approached, uh, he started to see the war was not going to end. And by the 29th, he came down with a fever 
By the 30th, he was unconscious and he died on the 31st. His dying hope led him to have no defense against the diseases in the camp. And Frankel watched this over and over again. He said only a few prisoners had what he called an inner liberty, a freedom that allowed them to separate themselves from the circumstances and the suffering they were walking through. And if you're like me, you're going, how, how did this happen? How can somebody live this way? Friends, listen, this is the key to life in this world of suffering. If you can't, you can't get through life without, without getting through suffering, and you can't get through suffering without a living hope. And praise be to God, those of us who have received Christ and have been born again have a living hope. He said that he determined that life only has meaning if we have something that goes beyond this life. Now, Frankel didn't get to quite where we're going to get today, but he knew that. He, he who has, here's what he wrote, and actually he was quoting, quoting another philosopher. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. He who has an eternal why can bear any how in the present. So look, your future hope completely impacts the way you live in the now. Let's talk about how this happens. See, our hope has to be something that goes beyond. How about this? Our health, our family, professional achievement, fortune, position in society. It's got to be something else. It's got to be something more. Because what is life except the stripping away of those things over time? And those of us who are older know this better than the rest of us. Now, some of you are thinking, again, you're thinking, well, a good thing I'm not going to be in a concentration camp. Um, no, no, no. What is life but the inevitability that those things are circumstantial at best? And some of you already, even young people, you're starting to experience, man, I, I think I get this. I, I know what this is like. But look at this. God, by his mercy, allows us in life to have these things perhaps stripped away from us along the way, designed, and his great hope is that we would turn to him to find hope, not the things of this world that are temporal and fading. So what is it? This, this hope that we have is our salvation through Christ. He is our treasure. He is our hope because he is alive. This is why the resurrection means so much to us even today. So secondly, okay, spend enough time on the first one. And in fact, more time on the first. Where do we get it? Where do we get this hope? We get it from God. Look at verse three. By the mercy of God, he has caused us, we said, to be born again into this living hope. He's done this thing. We haven't done this. This, this being born again is, is, happens as Christ comes into our hearts, changes us by his grace through faith. But look at this. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. An inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. He's saying it's unchangeable, it's untouchable, and I love this, it's kept. This word means locked up. It's guarded, secured, guaranteed for you to experience this. Listen, if you have received Christ, if you've been born again, you are now living in eternity, an eternal life right now. Who you will ultimately be when we get to heaven is who you are now becoming it's as if it's already happened. Are you, listen, are you born again? If you're not born again, you do not have a living hope. All of your hope is found in this world. And it will crush you. You have no hope to live in the end. You need this gospel hope. Look at number three. Why do we need it? Look at verse six and seven. Because all other, we said it, all other, uh, other hope is circumstantial and dying. We need it because we, we turn to dying hope. See, most people, think about it. You look at our books, our movies, our songs. Most of the time, we're looking for romantic love. Our hope is found in another person. If I could just find another person, then I'll be okay. And, and for you, if it's not your boyfriend or girlfriend or hope for a boyfriend or girlfriend or hope for a spouse, we often turn to our kids, don't we? Our hope is found in our children, or our hope is in a better job. Our hope is in the next thrilling experience. Our hope is in a new and improved me. That's what I'm really hoping for. Until we don't get there, and we face the trials and struggles of this life. But there's more. Why do we need it? Look at verse 6. This is really the application of the message. 
We need it because for a little while, this is his way of saying, uh, in this life, you will face various trials. And this, this various means many kinds of all kinds. It literally means multicolored trials that are going to come your way. You will, your circumstances will change. You will suffer. And all of life, if it's based on your circumstances, will be crushing. Is there another way to live? So watch this. The last question. How can we live in it? This is where I want to really apply this. How do we appropriate it? Peter says there is actually hope in suffering. This is what separates Christian hope, the Christian life, from all other lives that people might live. Most people can't rejoice in any and all circumstances, listen, because their, their, their joy is a circumstance. Most people can't live with hope because their hope is a circumstance. When it's stripped away, they have no hope. When it's taken away, you have no joy. Once it is stripped away, then you, you, you can no longer live. This is what Frankel came to. And so instead of moving from despair to hope, here's what we do. We move from despair to a new job, despairing to health, despair to better relationships with people in my life, despair to a new improved me, despair. See, we don't move from despair to gospel hope. Say, well, Jeff, what do you mean? Move from despair to who you are already in Christ, who he now has made you to be. So look at, look at this. This is what he's talking about. See, most Christians, we, we kind of think, we walk, through, we walk through trials and we think, well, I, I just, I'm just going wait to wait till heaven. And this is what unbelievers struggle with too, watching us. Like, you're going through such a trial. This is terrible. Uh, praise God. It's okay. I'm going to heaven. Now, that's part of it. That's part of this eternal hope, certainly. It's beyond this life. But think about it. How did Jesus go to the cross? Did he say, well, I'm, I'm being whipped to death. Praise God. You know what it says? It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He cried out in agony on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In despair, he still was experiencing the joy of accomplishing God's will. Why? So that you and I might become his treasured possessions. Here's what's fascinating. Look at verse 7. I'm going to get off track a little bit because this is really important to see. Verse 7, the language is such, and I've studied all kinds of commentaries here because what I, what I discovered here shocked me. It says here that what this genuineness of our faith is tested through trial and struggle. And if we remain faithful to the Lord and our hope is placed in Him and who we now are in Him, that we're loved completely, forgiven, that we have a new identity in Him, our worth and our hope, our value is not found in circumstances of this life. It's found in him. Then we may be found to result. This kind of persevering faith is found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at this. It doesn't say praise and glory and honor to Jesus. Now, ultimately, that's where this lands. But here's what it's talking about. And, this, and hang with me here. Praise and honor and glory brought to those who remain faithful through trial and suffering. But yes, ultimately, our praise and our glory is to Him because He's the one who has made this possible for us to live. We don't have to separate sorrow and joy. We don't have to separate despair and hope. We can actually live. See, there's a dynamic relationship between the two. As I walk through suffering, no. When I will walk as I do in this life, I'm drawn to Christ. He says, you love Him. You don't see Him even now, but you love him and you believe our trials are to draw us closer to Christ because we in the end are his treasured possessions. It's why Jesus would say, friends, listen, we have crossed from death into life. This is who we now are. We live with an eternal hope. So listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7 through 12. But we have this treasure. What is this treasure? Living hope in Christ. In jars of clay. What are these jars of our dying bodies? To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. 
We then become witnesses to everyone who watches us walk through suffering and trials of every kind. And then look at verse 8 and 9. You can see it on the screen. Let's read this together, in fact. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And he goes on, listen to this. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that in the life, the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Christ died. He was resurrected. We walk through. uh, We're constantly dying. We're constantly dying. And, And yet the life of Christ is constantly being resurrected in us. We're alive so that, he says, for we who are alive are always being given over to death. For Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. His life, his resurrection life is being seen in me regardless of what I go through. I can point to him and to eternal hope that I have in him. And Christ is glorified and others are brought to him. When Jesus died on the cross, he cried out the cry of despair. He was forsaken so that you and I would never be forsaken. He was crushed so that we would not be. He was struck down, but he was not destroyed. He rose again on the third day so that we might be born again, so that we can live with a, with a, with a living hope, but only if you're born again, only if you receive, watch this, by faith this thing is kept, not by our works, praise be to God, But by faith in what he has done, the finished work on the cross, with joy, we worship him regardless of what comes our way. You can live above your circumstances with joy. But even more, through your circumstances, through your trials and suffering, he is refining you to be like gold, a precious, shining gold and treasure for him. So that when you find yourself in heaven and we're all heading there into eternity someday, we will have received then the reward for our persevering spirit and our faith that we will, we remember and we will not give up and we'll trust him through all things. The old hymn, I love it. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Christ, the solid rock on him, I stand All other ground is sinking sand. Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, we thank you for the grace that has come to us in Jesus. And we thank you that we have a hope that goes beyond our circumstances. And I pray for every person here. In fact, friend, you just just pray. Praise God for the hope you have because of Christ, regardless of what's coming your way. I'm aware this week many of you are walking through kind of life-changing moments. You can trust Him. He has you in the palm of His hand. And if you've been born again, you have a living hope that will not perish, regardless of what circumstances come your way. In fact, your suffering will drive you closer and closer to Him so that the glory of Christ may be revealed in your life. And your great reward is coming in heaven. Do not give up. Don't give up. Trust him. Love him because he has first loved you. God, we give you our lives. All that we have is yours. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.